and asking the one who will come again that he might just visit us now before he comes. Would you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, we turn to you now. We're so grateful to be in your Sabbath. We're thankful to be alive. We understand that you desire us to be your obedient servants. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would take over our lives now. That you would change the way that we walk with you now. The way that we desire you. We ask, Lord, that you would do for us what we seem unable to do for ourselves. Would you cause us to fall in love with you one more time? Would you cause us to give our hearts to you today? We ask, Lord, blessings on all those who have been named, countries, people, so far this morning, and all those who have lifted up the needs of others this morning during our service, of both heard and unheard, we ask that you would send your spirit to be with them now and ready them for your soon return here to this earth to gather your kingdom. This we ask, Jesus, by your blood, by the love and grace of your Father, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. This, this quarter is, uh, uh, I'm looking forward to this quarter. The theme of the quarter is God's servant waiting and watching. God's servants waiting and watching. During his prayer, Elder Bazuil pleaded to God uh, for in his, in his, from his perspective, all that Elder Bazil uh, could see given the things that have taken place in St. Vincent and this country and elsewhere is that to quote him, sin is marching through this world. And that hate has surrounded us. I thank you Elder Bazil for pointing out what we should not forget, that we live in a dying world. And yet I find optimism this morning. I, I find joy this morning that in the middle of all of this mess, if I listen long enough, I will hear the voice of Jesus. If I look just right, I will see the actions of Jesus. I, 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 I want you to understand that in your family, in your life, on your job, in your community, wherever you are, just look at Jesus. What is he doing? What has he saved you from? We are in another Sabbath hour here now because Monday he did something good. Uh, Tuesday, he did something good. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and here you are today again because God has not fallen asleep despite the chaos of the world. God's still in control. Look at Jesus. When we look at Jesus, we consider him to be our savior, our high priest, our advocate, our judge, our redeemer. Lily of the Valley, or Rose of Sharon, or Bright and Morning Star, or Forgiver. But when the Father looks at Jesus, he sees something different. And it's that that I want to focus your attention on right now. Would you turn with me to the book of Matthew? And would you turn to the 12th division of that book? Matthew, in writing his gospel here, returning to Matthew 12 and verse 18, Matthew is borrowing from the Old Testament. He's quoting Isaiah. In Isaiah 42, uh, God speaks through that prophet about his son. Uh, Matthew here in chapter 12 and verse 18 quotes from there, and here's what it says, beginning at verse 18. Behold, my servant, 
I, I mean, just, just, just take your eyes off all of the chaos around you and look at my servant. I want you to just focus on him. I, I, he is my servant. I, I, he does my bidding. Behold my servant. I, and I don't want you to look at anybody else. I don't want you to look at the folk who are getting vaccines. I don't want you to look at the, 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 the folk who are dealing with all the volcano ash. I, I want in the middle of your chaos that you would look, behold my servant. Why? I have chosen him. Behold my servant whom I have chosen. I have chosen someone that you ought to be focusing on when you're going through your hardships. Behold my servant whom I have chosen. In fact, I'll tell you why I chose him. My beloved. Uh, God is saying, I know that you're going to come across a troublesome time, but when you do, I want you to take a look, a focused view. Behold, my servant, who I have sent to be there with you, my servant, whom I have chosen just for your circumstance, my servant, whom I love, I have sent him. And in him, because he's a faithful servant, because he's an obedient servant, because he's a submissive servant, it says, in him, I am well pleased. It says, in whom my soul is well pleased. I, I, I love him. I've chosen him. I've made him my servant. I've told him what to do so that you can be all right. And when I consider my servant, the Christ, your savior, Jesus, my soul is well pleased. I mean, God, we have this view of God as being this authority way above us, who is firm, who is stoic, who brings down judgment, but yet this God is one who can be pleased and is happy that his son, his servant, Jesus, would come and see about your problems. Behold, my servant in the middle of your chaos, whom I have chosen to deal with your chaos. He is my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. In fact, I have put my spirit within him so that he will do just as I commanded. I will put my spirit upon him. Here is a God who is not lost on the failings of this world. It's not lost on the challenges that come into your life. But here's a God who answers the challenge before the foundations of the world. Here's a God that sends his son to be his servant so that you can be okay. And if God views his son as this servant, and if we accept Jesus Christ and desire to be like Jesus, then my friends, you and I, our, our, our identity is not just children of God, which we are, men and women of God, boys and girls of God, but we are servants of the living God. And it is this topic of servants, the theme we have, God's servants watching and waiting. I thank uh, John for reading for us so well earlier for scripture reading. I would turn your attention to it briefly. It is found in the book of Matthew. So you're right where you are. It is in the 24th division and it comes to us from verse 45 to 47. If God is pleased with his servant, 
And he says, man, look at my servant. Have you seen him? Did you see what he's doing? Look at my servant in the middle of your trouble that I need you to understand that Jesus wants to be able to look at everybody in heaven and said, hey, have you seen my servant down there in Philadelphia? Have you seen them in Chestnut Hill? Look at my servants. He's expecting that if we are obedient, if we follow him, if we're guided by the spirit, that just like God can have confidence in Jesus as his servant, that Jesus can have confidence in you as his servant. Matthew 24 and verse 45. Who then, this is Jesus speaking, is the wise, is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Who is wise and faithful? Who is being obedient? Who is the person God has made a servant? Jesus has made a servant and is expecting to see good things from that servant who is then a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord have made rule over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Ah, Jesus isn't just coming to the earth to stop by. He's coming to see you in action. As Seventh-day Adventists, we are waiting for the second advent. We, 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 we desire to see Jesus doing something. And the text says here that Jesus desires to see us doing something as well. That he desires when he comes back that you will be active in your servitude for him. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. God's got a plan for you. Not just for your life, he's got a plan for you. In the next number of weeks, we'll take a look at what happens to those who overcome and what God has planned for them. God. He has a plan for you. Now, we are not living in the disciples' time, though they expected the Lord to return momentarily. We're not living in the 1800s where we had the great disappointment. We're not living in the 60s where we had such chaos in this country. We're not even living in the 80s we're not living in the 90s. Where we are today is on the very edge of time. We don't have time to fool around anymore. Jesus is soon to come. The kingdom is going to come. And, and Jesus is asking the question here, when I come, who will I find as a faithful servant doing what I asked? Uh, 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 helping those people I gave them, being influential in the, in the circle I placed them in, using the talents that I gave them. Who is this faithful and wise servant? I want to raise my hand when Jesus asked this question. Lord, here I am. Gave me two talents, I got four. Lord, here I am. Gave me one, I got two. Lord, here I am. Whatever you've asked me to do, I want with confidence and with honesty to look God in the face and say, I'm covered by your robe of righteousness. I've done all that you want. Lord, take me home. There is a text. I want us to read, if you would go to the second uh, Peter, second Peter, the third division of second Peter. Go there with me, if you would. Second Peter, third division. And I want to begin at verse nine. Second Peter. 
chapter 3, beginning at verse 9. I'll read from verse 9 to 14 for you. It will be the body of our thought for today. Remember, the construct is that God's son is his servant. And he's come and done what God wants for us, for you and for me. Now that he has returned to glory, his Holy Spirit moves among us. And if we allow him, moves within us and changes us. And while this is taking place and God's servant above is waiting to return, he is expecting that we would anticipate his return and live accordingly. In effect, we need to live for the return of Jesus. There is a warning that Peter has here for us and an encouragement. Second Peter chapter three in verse nine, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us for, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So you have not seen him return. You've, you've heard about this return and, and you've not seen it materialize, but don't count that like he's slack. No, don't count that like he's slack at all. Don't you think there's weakness in the promise? The only reason he hadn't come back is because he is loving towards you and wants even more people saved for his kingdom. So he's waiting for you to get into your spiritual senses and follow him. This is what Peter is saying. The next word begins with but, which, 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 you know, in our, in our language almost removes everything else that was said. Uh, yes, there's grace, but here's what's really coming as well. Yes, look, look at it. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Everything you know is going to be gone. The biggest buildings are going to be gone. The mountains are going to be gone. Uh, listen, everything is going to be gone. The heavens, the lights, the stars, they will melt away with fervent heat. They will be gone with a great noise, the text tells us. Your favorite car is going to get burned up. Your wonderful house is going to get burned up. That corner office that you've been eyeing on the job is going to get burned up. Everything is going to melt when Jesus comes. Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Seeing then that all of this is just vanity. Seeing then, as Solomon points out, the only way to go is to follow Jesus. The only way to go is to worship God because everything else is vanity. Since all of this is going to be dissolved, it's going to be burnt up. Since you can't trust in any of these things because they're temporal, what ought you to do now? Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversations and godliness? He answers his question before the question mark comes in. What kind of servant ought you to be in holy conversations and godliness? What, uh, what should you be talking about in holy conversations and godliness? Uh, what should be the focus of your mind? Holy conversations and godliness. The things you take into your mind, holy conversations and godliness. He does not allow you to answer on your own. He gives you the answer. The servants of God, if they are to please God, if they're to be ready for the day when everything will be uh, dissolved, then they need to be so focused on holy things and godliness that when these things disappear, we will not be taken by surprise. And, and, and Peter is optimistic here. Peter's optimistic here. He's, he's sending this letter uh, to a group of, of, of folk who are believers and Peter's optimistic. Look at what he says in verse uh, at 12. Looking for 
and hastening unto the coming day of the Lord wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. We are, ought to be living for his return, looking, waiting and watching as good servants, looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ. And it says, racing, hastening onto the coming day of the Lord. We shouldn't be waiting for Jesus to show up in our actions, in our thoughts, in our inclinations, in our drive, in everything we do, everything we say. We should be racing towards Jesus. Uh, whatever you didn't do good yesterday, go ahead and do it better today. Uh, whoever you didn't forgive before, forgive them now and be gracious to the other people. Your actions should be hastening you towards the coming of Jesus Christ. If you're going to live for Jesus, you need to let go of the world. Look at verse 13, nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him with peace, in peace, without spot, and blameless. And the question then arises, since I'm a servant who has not been loyal to his command, if, since I'm a servant that has been having some trouble, since I'm a servant that has been in spiritual detention, since I'm a servant that hasn't gotten it all right all the time, since I'm a servant that, 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 that keeps falling down, how can I get ready for the day when Jesus is going to be here? Wherefore, beloved, seeing that we look for such things, let us be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. I've got three things to provide for you as guidance from the Bible, how can you be a faithful and wise servant? So that when Jesus comes, he finds you doing as you had been instructed. And this first is you need to be a servant of the word. You need to be a servant of the word. You need to be a servant of this word. It, it, it needs to guide everything you do. You need to be a servant of the word. And, and I have two texts to prove this to you. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. We're not going to stay there long. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, uh, lest at any time we should let them slip. We shouldn't just hear them, we should do them. It says, therefore, we ought to give more earnest heed. I'm going to act on what I heard. I'm going to follow what I've heard and more earnestly so that these, the, the guidance, the, the, the instruction, the hope, the salvation does not slip from my grasp. That's Hebrews 2, 1. I got another one for you. Psalm, Psalm, David. David speaks about this. Psalms uh, 119. You know where I'm going. Psalm 119 and verse 11. David, David is frustrated that he keeps making mistakes. And, and he asks the question in verse 9. Psalm 119, verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? And he, and, and he uses the same word that we find in Hebrews. He says, by taking heed thereunto, according to thy word. I need to be a servant of the word, or I will not be a servant in glory. I can't make it to glory without being a servant that's guided completely by the word of God. But he doesn't stop there. Verse 11, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. How can I cleanse my way? Oh, I've got to do according to what I've heard. I've got to act 
on what I've heard. I can't just pretend that I did not hear. I can't just read it academically and like the way it sounds. I need to act it out so that Jesus likes the way it looks. And so the first piece is that we would be a servant of the word. The second I want to provide you here is that you need to be a servant of prayer. You heard Diana speak about it earlier, and we've had multiple prayers today. Before the Sabbath is over, God is going to get tired of hearing our voice because we're going to keep praying to him anyway. But you've got to be a servant of prayer. When Christ, God's servant, was here, he did nothing without talking to his father first, early in the morning, late at night, throughout the day. He was on his knees asking God, where should I go? When should I stop? Who should I talk to? Who should I choose? What do you want me to do? Can you heal this person? Can you do this? Lord, uh, Father, I want to glorify you. I know I ain't got to ask you to do it because of how good you are, but just so these folk know who you are, would you heal this man? He speaks to his father about everything. He did not just go on doing things on his own. He was in one with his father through prayer. That was the kind of servant Jesus was. And if you are a Christian, if you desire to be like Christ, if you are a Christian, then you need to be the kind of servant he is. You can't take a step without talking to Jesus. You've got to be in communion with him. Turn with me, turn with me to, to, to Psalm 55. We're in Psalms already. Go back. A Amen. Chapters. Amen. Go, go back, go back a, a couple of chapters here. Uh, let's go to Psalm 55. Let's go to Psalm 55. And, and I want to turn your attention uh, to verse 16 uh, through 18. Uh, Psalm 55, put a note on it. Psalm 55, starting at verse 16. As for me, I don't know about y'all, but as for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. Not might, I'm not hoping, I'm not wringing my fingers, wondering if he's gonna show up. I'm gonna call on the Lord. I don't know about y'all, but I'm calling on the Lord and he shall save me. The servant of God needs to be a servant who is guided and moved and governed by prayer. Evening and morning and all noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. He will hear it not just because I'm going to be consistent, but he'll hear it because of the God he is. Verse 18, he hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many with me. Listen. If you are to be the servant of God, one that, that Christ can say, behold my servant there in Chestnut Hill. Behold my servant there in Philadelphia. Behold my servant there in 2021. Behold my servant in the middle of the chaos, uh, chaos, COVID, uh, 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 chaos. We, we, we just want God to have full authoritative uh, statements that testify about his confidence in you. He wants to speak about you in this way, but Jesus is not going to lie now. You've got to give Jesus something to talk about. In order to do this, you need to be a servant of prayer. I got another text for you. Let's go over to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. You can just put a pen on these. I'm going to go by it fast. 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 7. And, and I want to take us to verse 14. Uh, uh, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their lands. I don't know what your problem is this morning. I don't know what you caused. I don't know how long it's been running in your family. I don't know uh, what you're on the brink of. I'm telling you that since you are spiritual Israel, since you're spiritual overcomers, since you are children of God, men of God, women of God, boys and girls of God, that no matter what your problem 
problem is he's saying, if my people who are called by my name just call out to me in prayer uh, and turn away from their wicked ways, I'll do something they've never seen. I'm going to remove their sins far from them. And I will heal their family. I will heal their marriages. I'll, I'll heal their situation. I will heal them if they but just turn to me in prayer now. The last thing I want to share with you, the servant of God will need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's no other way around it. And if you're going to be a servant of God, you need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Uh, you need to have God's Spirit govern what you do, govern what you say, govern where you go. Govern what you watch. You need to have God's spirit govern your entire life. The servant of God. I want to turn your attention uh, to the book of Galatians and chapter 5 when we get there in Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. And I've been studying for a good amount of time now, last maybe five or so weeks on just this section of Galatians. And I'm taken by it. Galatians chapter five, starting at verse 22, and really focusing on who the servants of God ought to be. How can I tell who's a servant of God? Watch what it says. Galatians 5, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. You do these things, you cannot be under the condemnation of God's law. They're the fruit of the Spirit. If I plant the spirit inside of me, the fruit that comes out of that is that I am loving, I'm gracious, I'm long-suffering, I'm patient, I'm meek, I'm faithful. Who then is that faithful and wise servant? Those who have the spirit of God embedded within them. Verse 24, and they that have crucified the flesh with the affections thereof. They have done away with the affections and the lusts that come along with the flesh. If we live in the spirit, let us also then walk in the spirit. Paul here, at the close of his chapter on, on, on the, the antagonistic view of the spirit versus the flesh, wants to tell us, wants to convince us that there is a, 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 an amazing transformation that's possible for the servant of God. For those who crucify the flesh, they leave the old man, their old person, the old habits nailed to the cross. It's been crucified. It's dead to them now. But they are alive now in Christ. Uh, and, and the fact is that the Holy Spirit who lives in the believer will change your heart. You can't right now figure out how to deal with her. You can't figure out how to deal with him. If you allow the spirit to come inside of you, he will change your heart. The servant of God is changed so that everyone that God surrounds them with is loved. When I crucify the old man, he doesn't get to come back. I can only view him from the, the, the rear view mirror of life. And he's a memory that fades away on a road long forgotten. When Jesus comes back, he wants men and women who are changed because of his blood, because of his robe of righteousness. Men and women who are his servants, who are obedient, who are submissive, who are loving, who are gracious. Jesus desires that you give your heart completely to him. 
You and I don't know when he's going to come, but we are sure that he is going to come. For we're told in Hebrews, for yet a little while. Hebrews 10, 37, and he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. We're told in Revelation 22, verse 12, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Who then is that good and faithful servant? who will listen to the voice of God that says in the middle of your chaos, behold my servant. In the middle of your trouble, behold the one I have chosen for you. In the middle of your trial, behold the one that I love, who has died for you, who has made my soul well pleased who have put my spirit upon in the middle of your trying to be a better servant, look to my servant. Behold my servant, the savior of the world. My friends, Jesus will come soon. He asked the question with some anxiety, who then? is a faithful and wise servant. Will you be one? A servant of prayer? A servant of this word? A servant baptized by the Holy Spirit? For if you are not these three things, I don't want Jesus to come with you in that state. Would you bow your heads with me? We want to pray about your servitude to God and our readiness for his return. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we give you glory for the hope of salvation through your son's blood. We ask now that you would change us in this moment right now, Father, that we might be acceptable servants to you, servants of the word, servants in prayer, servants baptized by your Holy Spirit power so we might be fruitful and that we might multiply your kingdom by the work that you set before us. We pray this now, Father, asking that you would hedge around those now who need special protection to be the kind of servants you desire and you're pleased with. We pray this in your son's name, by his blood, by your grace, by your Holy Spirit power. Amen and amen.